Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. And Yahuwah said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship me on this mountain.
the Most High be praised. We bless the Almighty today for his mercies and his kindness to us. This time we want to welcome each and every one of you who are joining us today by live stream. The Almighty be praised. I want to say bless the Almighty for his great grace and his wonderful works to us. Hallelujah. We're thankful for the Creator and for all that He has done. Hallelujah. I want to say Shabbat Shalom to my mother-in-law. I just saw that she got online with us by live stream. We thank you for your participation with us today in the mighty name of Yahshua. And today we want to bring our minds in. We want to recognize that on the Shabbat, the Sabbath, when we come together, that we want to recognize this is a sacred time. The Almighty has set aside the Sabbath and declared it to be a holy convocation. There are many who are unaware of the fact that the Sabbath is a holy convocation. The scripture teaches us in Leviticus chapter 23, in the first few verses, it talks about the Sabbath, that the Sabbath, while it is yet a day of rest, it is also called a holy convocation. The phrase holy convocation simply means a set-apart time for gathering. So for those who wonder why we feel very strongly about gathering on the Sabbath. It's because the Almighty commanded us to do so. It is not just a day that we set apart for rest, but he said it is to be a holy convocation, a set apart sacred time for gathering. And so that's our purpose for gathering. That's our purpose for doing what we are doing, not just because it's a good idea, even though it is a good idea, but we do it because the Almighty commanded it to be so. And so I want us to be mindful of this truth. It is important that we know why we're doing what we're doing. And everything that we do in our faith, it is important that we understand it and its meaning and its purpose. You know, I've found so oftentimes in the uh, practicing of our faith and in many instances when people practice their faith especially children growing up they do it because mama said you got to do this or daddy said you have to do this or you coming with me to the worship house because that's what we do but it is more important that we understand the why and the wherefore behind what we're doing because when we do it in that way, then we have greater meaning, we have an understanding, and it makes the practice of our faith more profitable for us in our worship and service to the King. So I want us to uh, understand that. Uh, let us uh, put aside the stress of the week. Let us put aside whatever things that might uh, be on our minds. Y'all know how it is. Sometimes folk come to the house of worship and, you know, they, they're, they're carrying the stress of the week. They, they got uh, some bill they have on their mind. They're wondering how they're going to make ends meet and all of those things. And, and those are important things. But the Almighty calls us to release our minds from those things, set this time aside to focus on Him and to believe that he is a covenant keeper. That as Yahshua said, the Father knows what things you have need of before you even ask him. But he says, seek first the kingdom of Elohim and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. And I believe a part of the seeking of first of the kingdom is our recognition that the obedience to the commandments of Elohim are to be done and accomplished. So with that being said, I want us to stand to our feet. 
uh, wherever you are, even you who might be watching us by live stream. If you are able to stand, stand. If you are not, then you can remain seated. But we stand because it is a, a means of offering reverence to the Creator as we offer prayer. Abba Yah, we thank you, we bless you, we praise you for your mercies and your kindness to us. We recognize that as we have gathered together that we are seated together with Messiah in the heavenly places. The scriptures teach us that we are seated not will be seated, even though that is our future destiny, but it says we are seated, which is present tense. And so while we're in these fleshly bodies, there is yet something in the spiritual and the supernatural that takes place where our spirit is there in the heavenlies with you. And we recognize this sacred transportation in the spirit. We recognize it all, even though we might not even see it, although we might not be able to comprehend it, but we believe it by faith. And we thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your goodness. We ask, Abba, that you would forgive us of our sins, Cleanse us of anything that we might have done against you, whether in word or in deed, so that as we connect with you, as we offer praises to you, as we do those things that you have commanded us to do, it might be acceptable in your sight and it may be received by you. We pray for the unbelievers today those in the, in the communities that surround us, that you would touch their hearts and their minds. May they turn in repentance. May they come to faith in Yahshua and be saved. May they recognize that you are King of Kings. You are the Sovereign One of Heaven's armies. You are the governor among the nations. There is none like you. We pray, Abba, for the sick, the afflicted, those that are suffering from the coronavirus. We pray for their deliverance, for their healing, their recovery. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, who are hurting, whose hearts right now are torn apart and Abba Yah words can't, can't express the pain they may be going through but we pray that you send your comfort to them send your healing to their hearts help them during this time that they may be able to make it through Give them strength through the process of grieving. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. For we know that you are mindful and we know that you are concerned about the needs, not just of your people, but of your whole creation. Yes, yes. Those who believe and those who do not believe. And so we pray for them, asking you to touch them where they are, but most of all, that they might come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, Abba Yah, we ask that you would order the course of this time as we gather. Let everything done be done to your glory. Even as the incense has been lit for the burning and the candles lit, as a model of your altar of incense in the heavens, that go up before you mix with the prayers of the saints, so also receive our prayers, that they may be found acceptable to you and move in the midst of Zion, that Zion may be what you have called Zion to be in the earth. 
and we will bless you. Yes. In Yahshua's great and mighty name. Yes. Amen. Praise be unto the Most High Yah. Blessed be his great name. For those of you who can remain standing, we'd like for you to remain standing for the declaring of the Shema. We're going to go to the book of Devarim, commonly called Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter and the fourth verse. Those who would like to follow along to know where we will be making the declaration of the Shema from. Devarim, chapter 6, verse 4. And after we declare the Shema in Hebrew, then we shall continue our reading through to verse 9. Shema Yisrael, Yahuwah Eloheinu Yahuwah Echa. Hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah, our Elohim, Yahuwah, is one. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them serve as an emblem on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now we're going to read from Devarim chapter 5, beginning at verse Six, and we're going to read through to verse 21. Devarim, chapter 5, verse 6 through verse 21. I, Yahuwah, am your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other Elohim before me. <coughs> you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of an image that is in heaven above or on the earth below, or that is in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, punishing the children for the iniquity or the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of Yahuwah your Elohim, for Yahuwah will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy or set apart, as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahuwah your Elohim. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, or your ox or your ass or donkey or any of your cattle or the stranger in your settlements so that your male and female slave may rest as you do. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, that's Egypt, and that Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor or provide for your father and your mother, as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you, so that you may long endure, and that your days may be long, and that it may go well with you in the land that Yahuwah your Elohim is giving to you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not crave your neighbor's house 
or his field or male or female slave or ox or ass or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Bless his name. Now we shall read from the writings of the apostles. We're going to go to the book of Mark chapter 12. We're going to begin at the 28th verse through verse 31. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? And Yahshua answered, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Baruch Hashem, yes, yes. bless his holy bless and God. great name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We always bless the Almighty for the opportunities that we have to read the scriptures and to share them with the people of Elohim on each Sabbath. We read these scriptures because we find it is necessary and important to give ourselves reminders. We human beings, I say sometimes we have selective memory. We hear what we want, and we remember what we want. And sometimes in our selection of what we want to hear and what we choose to embrace from the commands of the Almighty, we do it based upon what suits us. And haven't yet been fully delivered in all areas of our lives. You know I'm speaking the truth. And so it's, it's uh, necessary that we read the commandments to remind ourselves of what the Almighty desires out of us, his people. He gave the commandments for the entire world. He gave it to the entire world through Adam. And he did not have to have it written in tables of stone mm -hmm. during that time. But because of man's rebellion in going against the nature of Elohim, the Most High raised up a people that he would enter into covenant with to be light to the nations. And he had those teachings written on tablets of stone. See, the reason why the Almighty did that is because he was now making his people accountable. He said, if you he said he said, look, if you don't want to allow that which is a part of your nature that you received from me to guide you, then I'm gonna have to help you out. <laughs> And so he had it put on tables of stone and told our ancient fathers after he put it on tables of stone, you know what he said? He said, now I want you to take these words and put them in your heart. Yes, yes. See, it's always been the aim of the father to get the word back into the hearts of men because initially that's where it was. Yes. And then in time, he said, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit so that you can obey my commandments and statutes and judgments. There's a process that Elohim has. And, and in this process of him getting his word in us so that we can reflect his image and likeness in the world accurately, he sent his only begotten son, Yahshua. He who is called the Devar Elohim, or the word of Elohim, he sent him. So that he could complete 
that work of restoration and restoring man back to the original design. So when we read the commandments, we, we, we read them to remind us, and it serves as a testimony to the unbeliever that the Almighty has a way. He has a way in which he wants us all to live, and he has given us Yahshua to be the pathway, bringing us into everything that Elohim has intended for us. So I want to encourage us to love the way we who are in Yahshua to allow the word, the commandments, statutes of the Almighty to have its way in our lives because that's how we grow up into the fullness of who Yahshua is. It's by being filled with his word. So I want to encourage us today to do that. Hallelujah. This time I want to uh, ask my wife to come. She's going to come and lead us in some songs of praise. And uh, I trust that each one of you are excited about praising the Most High and about giving the Most High praise. The scripture says it's a good thing to give thanks to the Most High. And so let's do that at this time. All right, sweetie, you can come along. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. We bless the Almighty. We thank him for another opportunity to be here alive amongst the living. Like the old saints used to say, I'm just, we're thankful that we are yet in the land of the living. Amen. This year, if you never said that or believed that, you have got to believe that this year. Um, because we cannot take for granted everything, every blessing, every opportunity, you know, as we Got to talk to our family members um, over the, the last couple of days for the holidays. And, you know, just being so thankful to the Most High that they are still yet those that are, that we still have them. And we may not be able to physically embrace them, but the words that we send across the airways, even that can touch hearts. And my heart today is just um, heavy for those who, during this holiday season, do not have loved ones still yet in their lives, myself included. But I just believe that God is just able to keep us and keep us encouraged. So we're going to sing today. Um, hopefully it'll come through well on the Bluetooth. We're going to just sing some old school medleys. Um, I just felt a little bit like, you know, just like in the old church, how we used to sing those old school medleys. So um, we're going to go through a few of those with us today. Praise the Lord. We have to volume here. Yes, back in the day when we used to clap our hands and play our tambourines. Amen. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier. You can say in the army, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier.
soul's not. If your soul's not. Anchor and Yeshua, you will surely drift away. Drift away. Oh, there's a storm out on the ocean. And it's moving this way. If your soul's not. If your soul's not. Anchor in Yeshua. Drift away, Lord. Drift away, Lord. You will surely drift away. If your soul is not anchored in the master, you will surely drift away. I'm going to live so. Live so. God can use me anywhere, Lord. Where, Lord, anytime. I'm going to live so. Live so. God can use me. Use me. Bless 
Hallelujah. Bless his name. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you today. Why? 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 Hallelujah. Why? Bless the Almighty. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's give a hand of praise. Give him all the hand of praise. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Reminds me of that song, View the Land. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All we see right now might be death and destruction, but there is, I call, come to give you hope today. There Praise is more the hallelujah that he has for us. Amen. So be encouraged in this season. You may be grieving, you may be going through, but in this season, just remember that the Most High knows and he has more in store for us. And I'm excited. I'm holding on to hope. I'm holding on to faith. Glory. I'm holding on to his word. That he is keeping us. Hallelujah. Are you glad he's keeping yes, you? Amen. amen. Say amen. 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 Hallelujah. If you're glad to be kept by the Almighty, say amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't take it for Praise granted that glory. we're here on today. I don't take it for granted. Hallelujah. That I have a breath in my lungs and I have words to speak and I have ears to hear and my vision. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You be blessed in him. Amen. Back to your hands, Pastor Mode. Bless the Almighty. Well, the Most High be praised. We're so grateful for his mercies, his kindness, and his goodness to us. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. The Most High is worthy of all praise at all times. Amen. Yes, he is. I said all praise at all times. The scripture says, I will bless Yahuwah at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. You know, it's one thing to quote Psalm 34 and that first verse, but it's another thing to make that a reality in your life. Yes, yes. You know, we, we uh, so oftentimes do our best to become masters at quoting scripture when I believe the Almighty really wants us to become masters at living yes, the scriptures, to that. become masters at practicing the scriptures, actually putting, uh, you know, the, 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 the metal to the pedal and the rubber to the road. You know, he wants us to do He's not concerned about our articulation, being able to articulate everything uh, perfectly as it is, how he wants us to live the scriptures completely and perfectly. That needs to be our goal and our aim. Hallelujah. That in every circumstance, in every trial, in every situation, when things come upon us, when we have stresses that overwhelm our lives, we need to take the scripture and allow that word to become a reality in our conditions. Yes, bless I firmly believe that you can live a stress-free life where you can have all hell breaking loose around you with no certainty mm -hmm. in your mind based upon what you experience or what you can see. But when you have spiritual vision you. and you can take the promises of the creator Thank and you. know that he's working it out, Thank you, Lord. you can sleep good That's right. every day. <laughs> That's right. Hallelujah. That's why Abraham was able to go up to the Mount Moriah and to offer his son Isaac no doubt having so many different things in his mind. Mm -hmm. Elohim promised me a son. Mm -hmm. He gave me a son. I'm sure he probably thought in his mind, why would he take my son? Mm -hmm. He didn't verbalize any of those thoughts that we all know ran through his mind. Yeah. He didn't verbalize it because he had faith in the creator. And he didn't understand, no doubt, why would the creator command me to take my son's life? Why would he do such a, a unreasonable thing? Because to the natural mind, that's that's unreasonable. That doesn't make too much sense, does it? Yes, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Man, why are you going to tell me you're going to give me a son and then you're going to tell me to kill him? What, 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 what kind of Elohim are you? <laughs> see, see, we human beings have to come to terms with the fact that Yahuwah is sovereign and whatever he says, whatever he chooses to do, yes. whatever doesn't make sense to us is not your business. You say, well, that's not fair. Well, get out of your Greek Western mindset and begin to just trust what the word says and do what Elohim says. Hallelujah. It don't have to seem logical to you. Mm -hmm. It don't have to be a part of the logoes. Mm -hmm. That's the Greek word where it has to do with that which is logical, that which makes sense, that which is part of the reason, see. Mm -hmm. And we're so accustomed to thinking like that that we fail to understand that Elohim does what he wants to do and we are part of his plan. And we are to be discovering how we fit into his purposes. Well, that's uh, sermon one. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Just a word of encouragement. Sometimes when I come up here, I just begin to talk and things come out. They just kind of roll out. That's that's not a part of the teaching today. But I'll... I'll uh, Keep it to a minimum so we can uh, be timely. Hallelujah. But we bless the Most High for each and every one of you and trust that you have been blessed, that you have been encouraged uh, thus far. Want to uh, share a few announcements. As you know, we meet on each Sabbath at 1230. And we have our Sabbath time of worship. Then at 4 p.m. we have our School of Messiah Bible Institute where we have our lectures and teachings. Right now we are um, uh, teaching in the course called Theological Perspectives. And so I want to invite each one of you who are able to attend, whether you are a student or whether you are one who desires biblical and spiritual enrichment we invite you to be a part of that that's at 4 p.m. today also our midweek time of teaching which is on Wednesday at 7 30 p.m. we also provide a teaching there as well and uh, we also invite those of you who have prayer requests to share your prayer requests with us um, we have a prayer time that uh, we have on Wednesdays also at 6.30. Yes. Uh, the past couple of weeks, we have uh, not been having our uh, prayer times together. We've just been spending time with family, as, as most families have been doing during this time, uh, in honoring the king and celebrating the uh, holy set-apart time. We celebrated Hanukkah and just finished that about a week ago and just been enjoying this uh, season and blessing the Most High for His goodness and His graciousness to us. I want to um, share our history bit with us today and I want to share it from a book of scripture. Now this book of scripture that I'm sharing it from is uh, from what uh, the Protestant churches would call the Apocrypha. Uh, I don't call these books the Apocrypha. Uh, I regard them as the second set of canonical books because our ancient ancestors in the faith, and you can go and read ancient documents in the apostolic canons you will find in the apostolic canons which uh, is believed to have been produced in the second century CE they included these books that have been called apocrypha as part of the scriptures and the churches of the east commonly called the orthodox churches and the churches of the west commonly called the Roman Catholic Church, also embraced these books as well. And so I am one who firmly believes in accepting and embracing 
the scriptures that the first and second century believers embraced and regarded as sacred to them. So I know that, that, uh, that in doing that I will find myself outside of the pale of Protestant orthodoxy. I do not consider myself a Protestant. So uh, those of you who do come from Protestant churches and do hold that there is just only 66 books, I respect your position, but I have to explain to you mine so that you can understand the reason and the justification for which I read from this particular book that I'm going to read from. I consider myself in good company when I can say that I draw from the ancient fathers in the faith that are prior to both the development of both the Eastern and the Western churches. And so I'm going to read from 2 Maccabees. I'm going to um, begin at the second chapter, 19th verse, and I want to read through to verse 23. Just want to read something to us. Actually, let me go to the 16th verse. I want to start at the 16th verse because I want to highlight something in this scripture reading that points out how our Elohim was yet working among his people in between that time frame that many will declare to be where the Most High was not speaking between the period of Malachi and Matthew. And so in 2 Maccabees chapter 2, verse 16, listen to what this says. It says, since therefore we are about to celebrate the purification, we write to you. Will you therefore keep the days, or please, will you therefore please keep the days? It is Elohim who has saved all his people and has returned the inheritance to all and the kingship and the priesthood and the consecration as he promised through the Torah. We have hope in Elohim that he will soon have mercy on us and will gather us from everywhere under heaven into his holy place. For he has rescued us from great evils and has purified the place. The story of Judah Maccabee and his brothers and the purification of the great temple and the dedication of the altar and the further wars against Antiochus Epiphanes and his son, Eupiter, and the appearances that came from heaven. I want to read this part again. And the appearances that came from heaven so that the few in number those who fought bravely for Jerusalem, so that the few in number, they seized the whole land and pursued the barbarian hordes and regained possession of the temple, famous throughout the world, and liberated the city and reestablished the Torah laws that were about to be abolished. While Yahuwah with great kindness became gracious to them, all this which has been set forth by Jason of Cyrene in five volumes we shall attempt to condense into a single book. Now this information that I just read right here, basically it was an introduction that the writer is presenting in giving the information about 
how Elohim was with the Maccabees and how Elohim demonstrated his power with such a small military or militia to be able to conquer the great Grecian armies, to remove them from the land, to remove them from the city of Jerusalem, to recapture the temple and the city, and to restore it so that it may be in a state proper for worship. And so this introduction is about, number one, encouraging the Judean Israelites everywhere to remember to practice the days of Hanukkah, which we completed and which we celebrated and enjoyed in remembering the Feast of the Dedication of the Temple. And also recognizing the significance of the parallel and how that we in Yahshua are the temple of Elohim. And so when we read this, we read this to help to provide a short historical glimpse into how the most I was active and involved. Because you see, so oftentimes when certain religious institutions that may have an agenda that is not quite in line with the complete picture that Elohim has, and who, as taught, saying that I come from a Western theological Christian background, I was taught that these books that are in the middle of Malachi and Matthew, I was taught these books were off limits. We were taught Elohim did not have any prophets. We were taught Elohim didn't do anything in what is commonly called the intertestamental period. But I am discovering that the testimony of our ancient fathers is such that Elohim was working. Not only was Elohim working, but Elohim was doing mighty things, and he was showing himself with visible, tangible manifestations. Yes, yes. In some of the records in the Maccabees, it records how that there were warring angels that were seen going before them when they were fighting against these Greek armies. Oh my God. My Lord. That's their testimony. And so I uh, believe that it is important that we share this information in our history. It's important that we understand this piece of history so that we will understand, as I remember my apostle, the Most High Bless His Memory, taught us and he said that Elohim is always speaking. The issue is, is that we have to learn how to listen. Yes. And I've come to discover that it doesn't matter what condition his people might be found in, whether it's a righteous or a sinful backslidden condition. Elohim is always speaking. 
whether it is to direct us in a more perfect way or whether to send a word through the prophets to call his people to repentance, mm -hmm. he is always speaking and working among his people. And so I share this because it is my aim as a servant of the Most High that while I'm here in the earth, along with many others that he has raised up, I find that it is very important to set the record straight with regard to things that have been polluted in our understanding of the way of Elohim. And so I trust that this uh, reading has helped to shed some light. It's important that we understand that Elohim has always been moving, has always been working, and has always been speaking. So for us who celebrate the feast of the dedication, Hanukkah, we show enough regard it as the time of Elohim's miracle working power to preserve his people, to preserve his prophetic promises so that our King Yahshua may come into the world. His great name be praised. Hallelujah. Well, we're so grateful for each and every one of you. And we're thankful, again, for your participation. And we ask that you would prepare your hearts and your minds as we get ready to provide our teaching for today. Do you know we are in the book of Acts? And we're beginning chapter 23. As we navigate through this book, I trust that you have been learning and that you have been um, discovering some new things as we have been going through this book. Every time I read through the book of Acts, there's um, a great deal of information that I learn each time I go through the book, especially as we begin to understand it with Hebrew eyes. Mm -hmm. See, when we read the Bible and we're looking at it with Western European vision, we're not able to see the correct and proper perspective that the scriptures originally convey to us. But when we look at it with Hebrew eyes, we're able to get a more accurate understanding. We're able to see things that we did not see before. And that is the aim of our teaching as we move along through this book. So let's go to Acts chapter 23, and I'm going to begin at the first verse, and I'm going to read through to verse 10. Acts chapter 23. Verse 1 through verse 10. Let us read. While Paul was looking intently at the council, he said, Brothers, up to this day I have lived my life with the clear conscience before Elohim. Then the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near him to strike him on the mouth. At this, Paul said to him, Elohim will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting there to judge me according to the Torah? And yet in violation of the Torah, you order me to be struck? Those standing nearby said, Do you dare to insult Elohim's high priest? And Paul said, I did not realize, brothers, that he was high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a leader 
of your people. When Paul noticed that some were Sadducees and others were Pharisees, he called out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dissension began between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection or angel or spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledge all three. Then a great clamor arose and certain scribes of the Pharisees group or the Pharisees sect stood up and contended, we find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? When the dissension became violent, the tribune, fearing that they would tear Paul to pieces, ordered the soldiers to go down, take him by force, and bring him into the barracks. Let us pray. Abba Yah, thank you for this opportunity to be able to share the scriptures and to provide teaching. I trust in your Ruach, your spirit, to provide wisdom and to give insight in the teaching today. Bring forth instruction that would bring illumination and enlightenment to the hearer. Cause us to be able to understand your workings and how you moved through your servants. Provide an example and a parallel for us in how we are to live and navigate in this present world that your word and your work might be accomplished in the world. And we will give your name praise in the mighty name of Yahshua, our King. Amen. Amen. The Almighty be praised. Blessed be he who rules forever. I want to um bring us all up to speed because no doubt there are some who are listening to us possibly who were not listening to the teaching on last Sabbath. Because we're going through the book of Acts systematically, there are some parts of it that require us to bring in what was taught at a previous time. So in order for us to really understand these scriptures in context, we need to say a little something about how Paul got into this situation to begin with. You know, Paul initially, he had came to Jerusalem as we believe, to celebrate the Moedim because he testified to that. He wanted to get to Jerusalem so that he could celebrate Shavuot. And when he arrives in Jerusalem and he meets with the apostles, they inform him of misinformation. That's a kind word for me to use. Lies that were told about Paul by unbelieving Judean Israelites. They were saying that Paul was teaching the Judean Israelite brethren in the 
area of Asia Minor and in the Greek area of Macedonia. And he was saying that they need to teach their children, not teach their teach parents, not to circumcise their children, and that Paul was speaking against the temple. And so Paul, in agreement with the apostles, said he would go into the temple and perform the rite of purification. And as we've covered that section in the scripture, yes. we know that Paul went in with some other brethren who were also going into the temple to be purified, and they all went in, they offered sacrifice. And so after Paul had did that to demonstrate that there was nothing in him that was in opposition to keep in the commandments or in going to the temple and offering sacrifice, because you know they had to go in there and take with them some pigeons, you know, and offer that as a part of their purification process. Mm -hmm. You know, many believers who hear this information are probably very surprised because in their uh, understanding of the Christian faith, believers aren't supposed to be offering sacrifice. See, that's what they have been taught without understanding that Paul and Peter and many of the others, when they were at Jerusalem, as long as the temple stood, everything that involved the temple worship continued. Yes, amen. And might I add, when we go into the Messianic kingdom, mm -hmm. there's going to be a third temple and sacrifices and offerings are going to commence again. It's in your Bible. And I'm saying this because I want us as the people of Elohim to begin to come out of this fog in our understanding of the scriptures and begin to see the scriptures completely. Amen. You might say, you talk a lot about Western Christian theology. Yes, I do. Because the system has specifically targeted abandoning the Torah-based aspect of the way of Elohim. Just because we don't have a temple right now does not mean that Elohim does not want any kind of worship at the temple. He is the one that ordained the temple, and the only reason why it's not here right now is because we do not have the visible kingdom of Elohim on the earth. Because it represents the temple of Elohim in the heavens. I hope this helps somebody. Mm -hmm. I know it takes a while to unlearn and unthink certain things, especially when you have gone to Bible college and, and, and pastors begin to present information in such a way as to say that Elohim, he, 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 he don't want sacrifice and offering anymore. They take that one verse and don't interpret it rightly or properly because when King David made the statement and he said, sacrifice and offering you do not desire, do you all know that they were still offering sacrifice? When David made the statement, he was still going to the temple offering sacrifice. Amen. The point that David is making has to do with what Elohim prefers. He wants a right heart, a right mind, a right spirit devoted to him. And if a person does not have that, then they're coming to the temple, bringing a sacrifice is meaningless. Doesn't mean that he has caused it to completely cease. But we can talk about that as a subject in detail. But we see Paul here at the temple and those who spoke out against Paul who were also there 
in Jerusalem at the time. See, this is the reason why we believe it was one of the feast, the feast uh, times. Because those who had heard Paul teaching over in the areas of Macedonia, Asia Minor, over in Corinth, those who heard Paul teaching that put out the lie about Paul, they also were there in Jerusalem just as well. So what did they do? They go, cause a ruckus, Paul gets arrested, the Roman tribune takes him, gets ready to give him a beat down, and then realizes that Paul is a Roman citizen, so they have to back up from trying to beat the information out of him, and what happens is they bring Paul and they present him before the council. They bring him before the Sanhedrin. And they figured, look, you know, let, let's just find out from him having conversation with his own Judean Israelite brothers. Let, let's just allow him to work it out with them, and then after they're able to work it out, then we can figure out what we need to do. But if they can't work it out, then we're going to have to take other measures. You know, this, this is the mind of the tribune. Mm -hmm. So Paul is here, again, trying to explain himself. Yeah. And in the first verse, I mean, Paul wasn't able to really, you know, get out anything, you know. In the first verse, mm -hmm. it says that Paul was looking intently at the council. Yes. And he says, brothers, listen, mm -hmm. you know, up to this day, I, I have a clear conscience before Elohim. Yes. Now, he had already provided explanation to them. He had already given them his testimony. He had already told them that even, even the chief priests that gave me letters to go and persecute the direct, the way of Elohim. Yeah. You know, they, they know me. They, they know my zealousness for the Torah. They knew yes, yes. what I was doing. But I had an encounter, Paul said, with Yahshua. Yeah. And I had to submit to Yahshua after I had that encounter. He gave him his testimony. And so now he says, brothers, I have a clear conscience. He said, there's no guilt in me. He was very honest yes, he was. with those who were regarded as the leaders in Israel. See, this whole situation was what, was what I call a, a, a domestic dispute <laughs> mm -hmm. amongst brethren over religious philosophies. That's what it was over. And so, Paul, after getting that one statement out, he gets popped in the mouth. I mean, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't you know, it wasn't no, no, no fastening. It's like, man, you know, he's like, he's like, hey, hey, you know, he said, look, look, I'm good. He said, I, I, my, my conscience is clear. I, I, I haven't did anything wrong. I haven't did anything, you know, with ulterior motives. Then pop, you know, high priest told one of his officers, hit him in the mouth. And so Paul, after he got hit in the mouth, he begins to respond on a little bit of a different note. <laughs> this is interesting about Paul. You know, Paul, in the next part of the scripture, begins to reveal that he wasn't a pushover. He begins to reveal that even though he was a follower of the way, even though he was a follower of Yahshua, that he wasn't a punk. Paul 
was not somebody that would just allow someone to railroad him. Look at his response. He begins to say to the high priest, Elohim is going to strike you. You hit me? <laughs> Paul is like, you hit me? Elohim's going to hit you. You whitewashed wall. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> now, I don't know whether you all realize what Paul was saying or not. You know, <laughs> most of us who have come up in the things of Elohim, you know, we've been taught that we need to be very careful with our words. And we've been taught that we, you know, um, need to not ever use filthy language, right? That, that we, 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 ought, we ought never to call someone out their name. Mm -hmm. And I'm not advocating profanity. I'm, I'm not advocating using language that is disrespectful. But I, I, I'm just saying that I'm noticing something here about Paul's character that He's not always a nice guy. Here it is. Mm -hmm. Here it is. The high priest has his officer to hit Paul in the face. And Paul, being an astute student of Torah, Notice Paul's response. Paul said, Elohim's going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. He says, you sitting there trying to judge me according to the Torah. Check this out. And yet you are in violation of the Torah yourself by ordering someone to strike me. Paul knew what Torah said. As I mentioned in last Sabbath's teaching, that there are a great many things that Torah says about how we are to deal with one another as believers, Amen. as brethren in Israel. And Torah is very clear about the fact that we are never supposed to mm do any physical harm to each other without a cause. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing me? Amen. That's why I said on last Sabbath, when Yahshua said, if someone strikes you on one side of the face, give him the other. I said Yahshua was not given that command with respect to interactions that brothers have with each other, but he was given that command based upon Israelite interaction with Roman law enforcement. Because during the day in the first century, the Romans regularly, and I'll say regularly, will give a Hebrew Israelite a beat down at will. So in order to somehow bring about a peaceful situation, Yahshua says, if they slap you on one side, just give them another word, don't, don't, don't buck up, just. <laughs> and of course, the zealots had a different view. Mm -hmm. <laughs> zealots said, look, you know, they hit you, we, we go plan, and we going to come after them, you know. Yahshua was trying to help us to understand that, you know what, this beast you're dealing with, y'all, look, you ain't going to be able to take this beast down that way with violence. It's too big. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to use a different method. But you see, when we look at what Paul says in his response, Paul is telling the chief priests, 
the high priest, that what you just commanded this officer to do to me is against what Torah says. See, they had assumed that Paul was in the wrong. And they had not given Paul a fair trial. They had not taken time to discover what it was that Paul had done to cause this riot in Jerusalem. They just figured because they had heard some whispering. And they already had a bad feeling toward Paul anyway because they saw him as a turncoat. You understand? Mm-hmm. They, they like, look, you know what? He, he's not even doing, doing our, our bidding anymore. So we already don't like you. But when you arrest somebody, you have to go through the protocol of Torah. You don't just railroad somebody and treat them with disrespect and make them look like they're the villain. So Paul says, look, you up here trying to judge me according to the Torah and you violating the Torah yourself, you hypocrite, you whitewashed wall. I mean, Paul, Paul, was, ew, you know. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. See, see some, sometimes, sometimes, you know, you might have to tell, you might have to tell somebody a little something, something. <laughs> you know, nowadays, you know, if you, if you get bold and you begin to tell the truth and you got to call people out and you got to make them understand who they really are, you know, you begin to be looked at as somebody, oh, he ain't a Christian. He ain't saved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I'll tell you something. Any of these lying, demonic inspired folk come up around me trying to do some stuff, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you straight up what the words say and you might not like the way you get it. And the reason why is because I know my parameters within the framework of Torah. See, in our day and age, we've gotten so accustomed to all of this quote-unquote religious Christian niceties, and we don't have the boldness to deal with stuff the way Messiah dealt with stuff and the way Paul dealt with stuff because we are so concerned about our little reputation and wanting to be, mm, I, I want to say this right, I want to say this right. We, we, we want to be so, <laughs> we, we want to be so uh, uh, available to everyone. We want to be in a position where everybody loves us. And we're afraid to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. We want to be on the good side of everybody. Yes, yes, amen. Well, I'm going to tell you, I don't care about being on the good side of everybody. So long as I'm on y'all's side, I'm good. Yes, amen. Paul didn't know he was talking to the high priest. <laughs> Paul, Paul up here. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he quotes the scripture. Paul said, I didn't know I was talking to the high priest. Because I know the scripture says that you're not supposed to speak wrongly to the leader of your people. What's interesting about this is that Paul still recognized the high priest as being the leader among the people of Israel. Even though Yahshua had taken the power, had taken the authority of the kingdom from the scribes and the Pharisees and Sadducees because he had, even though they had already done that, yet the, 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 the physical structure of the governmental system in Israel that was yet in place was respected. Think about it. It's the same as like how Elohim said to Saul, I reject you as being king. Elohim had taken his anointing from Saul and given it to David, yes. but because the physical structures were yet in place, yes, yes. because the authority was upon Saul, 
while he was still alive, yet he was still respected. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. You see, this is interesting. Yes, yes. You see, what we have going on is, 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 a, is a complex situation. Because even though you have the sect of the Nazarenes, the Messianic Israelite community there, having the full vested authority of the kingdom power, yet they had to navigate in that time being subject to certain authorities that were in place until Elohim began to work things out differently so that those authorities would be removed. And of course that took place with the destruction of the temple. Yes, yes. But yes, yes. Paul respected the system and also Paul was one that honored the commandments. He shows that throughout these chapters that we've been looking at, chapter 22 and 23 that we're dealing with now. And what's interesting about Paul, I see, especially at this particular time in his ministry, because you see, at this particular time, Paul had already been in the ministry for quite some time. He had already made three missionary journeys. All right? And look at what Paul says. Paul was clever. He was clever. He notices that there were Sadducees and Pharisees. See, with the high priest being there, mm -hmm. you had the sect of the Sadducees. Because the Sadducees was that sect. It get its name from Zadok. Zadok was a name of one of the priests, yes. one of the fathers in the Aaronic line of the priests. And so from him, the name Zadukim came from. And they had the name Sadducee. Sadducee comes from Zadukim in Hebrew. And that was the sect that was primarily responsible for the temple services. They had developed into a whole sect. But the problem that existed was that as they developed into a sect, they began to develop some ideologies and some theologies that wasn't consistent with all of what the, the, the Torah said or what the prophets said. It, it was so much so that this particular sect did not even acknowledge the prophets. It only acknowledged the first five books of Torah. Interesting. They didn't believe in the resurrection. So obviously they sure enough didn't believe the writings of Daniel. Daniel talks about the fact that there's going to come a time when you read over in Daniel chapter 12. It talks about that there's going to be a resurrection of the righteous and a resurrection of the wicked. Yes. They didn't believe in no resurrection. Uh -huh. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in spirits. So, so they didn't believe in the supernatural, point blank. They didn't believe in the supernatural. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for me to understand how is it that this sect that had the authority over the priesthood, over the temple, how is it that they had come to such conclusions that they did not believe in the supernatural. You can read in the Torah and all you'll see is supernatural workings. You can read through Moses leading the ancient fathers and see nothing but the supernatural. Yes, yes. All in it. So what was it that caused these Sadducees <laughs> to not believe in the supernatural? I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But we notice
notice that the Pharisees was another sect, and, and they were there. All right? You had Sadducees there, and you had the Pharisees there, but the Pharisees believed in the supernatural. They believed in miracles, and they believed in casting out devils. We know that. Yahshua had said to them that, you know, if I cast out demons by the spirit of Elohim, then who do your children cast out demons by? So they, was, they was casting out devils too. They believed in the supernatural. They believed in angels. They believed in the resurrection. And so Paul looking at this situation and knowing that, look, you know what? I don't think I'm going to get out of this. <laughs> I, I think after Paul yeah. saw how he was being treated by the high priest, he knew that, hey, you know, they're not going to do justly with me. So Paul purposefully stirred up some stuff. He said, we got some Sadducees here. We got some Pharisees here. Yeah, yeah. He said, I know how the Sadducees and the Pharisees are with their theological perspectives. Mm -hmm. I know how they are. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell them that the reason why I have been arrested is because of the issue of the resurrection from the dead. Mm -hmm. So Paul says, I'm a Pharisee. I'm a son of Pharisees. Mm -hmm. Is this the same Paul? Is this, is this the same Paul who said that you are not under the law but under grace? This the same one, right? Yes, yes. This is the same one that, every, that, 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 that all of the anti-Nomianist believers say that we don't have to keep that Torah. Paul said, really? Is that what Paul meant? Mm -hmm. I ain't going to go deep into that. I've done a whole lot of teaching on explaining what Paul really meant by the concept of not being under the law and being under grace. Mm -hmm. I've taught about that. And the way it's being taught presently in most of quote-unquote Christendom is absolutely incorrect and it's inconsistent with Hebraic thought and understanding. Because if Paul really believed that, Paul wouldn't even be there going through all of this. Paul would have had to take a stand and say, look. I don't believe in giving no offerings at the temple. I don't believe it's necessary. No. Mm -hmm. Come on. If y'all going to teach this Bible, let's teach it with, with some consistency, with some historical accuracy. Come on. Yes. Man. Because I'm going to tell you, if, if that's what Paul really meant, then I can't trust anything this man would have to say, mm -hmm. especially being in this situation. He has invested a number of years in the ministry at this time. He's not a newbie. Yeah. He didn't establish Messianic Israelite communities all throughout Asia Minor in Greece and has gone and visited them twice. Amen. I said he didn't have three missionary journeys already. Yes, right? Yes, yes amen. But yet he says, I'm a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm up here thinking, man, the way the Bible is taught, you would expect for Paul to be denying mm -hmm. that he was a Pharisee. That's what I would think. Hey, you know. Yeah. That's what I would think. No. Paul did not deny that he was a Pharisee. He said, I'm a Pharisee. And I'm a son of Pharisees. A reason why Paul would say such a thing is because Paul still held to the core values of the sect of the Purushim. He still held to the core values. And he was a believer in the Messiah. And the Bible even says that there were those of the sect of the Pharisees that were part of the Messianic Israelite community. The ones who were going around saying that you have to be circumcised also in order to be saved. It says that they were the ones who were of the sect of the Pharisees. But they were believers in the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like that you had to quote unquote abandon being a Pharisee and be one who follows the Messiah. You just have to change your understanding. 
And circumcision was not a requirement for what we call salvation. All right? But Paul uses this. He says, I'm a Pharisee. And the reason why I am being arrested is over the issue of the resurrection from the dead. Paul figured he'd just throw that out there because, see, no one had ever given a plausible reason for Paul to be arrested in the first place. Mm -hmm. So Paul gave his own reason. Amen. He said, y'all going to arrest me? Y'all ain't even giving me no plausible reason as to why I haven't done anything. I haven't broken Torah. I haven't done anything wrong. Y'all going to lie on me. You're going to say that, 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 that I'm against the temple. You're going to say that I'm against the customs. You're going to say all of that. And I'm up here confessing to you that I'm a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Yes, yes. Y'all hear that? Mm -hmm. For those who are watching me by live stream, y'all hear that? Paul said he was a Pharisee, right? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. This is an interesting discovery. So what happens here is that a situation is created because now, <laughs> now you got the Pharisees upset with the Sadducees because they're like saying, now hold up, you're not going to take one of our boys and treat him like that. So now it just goes crazy. It just goes off the chain because you see what happening here is that now the situation has gone from bad to worse. Yes, yes. Because what Paul did, as clever as he was, he got the Pharisees that were there on his side and listened to what they say. Mm -hmm. They stood up and said, we don't find anything wrong with him. Go into verse 9, latter part of verse 9. It says, and certain scribes of the Pharisees sect stood yeah. up and contended. We find nothing wrong with this man. Mm -hmm. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? Yes. They're like, we all good with that. If he heard something from Elohim, he, we all good with that. Because mm -hmm. you notice, remember, remember, remember in his testimony, he was telling them about how he experienced the Messiah. Yeah. How he saw the light and how he heard the voice and how he was blinded. Y'all catching that? All of them were there listening to his testimony. Yes, yes. All of them were listening to his testimony. Go read it over in chapter 22. They were all listening to his testimony. And when these brethren of the Pharisees heard that he still claimed to be a Pharisee, they said, no, hold up, no, hold up, no, 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 no. You're not going to do him like that. If that was his experience, let him alone. See, I told you, this was a religious domestic squabble that they were having. And because the Pharisees defended Paul, the Sadducees were upset. See, you got you to understand why, why was it such a volatile situation. The reason why it was so volatile is because the Sadducees were the ones that felt that they had the complete authority because they were the ones who controlled the temple. And the Pharisees were a dominant, influential religious power among the community. And the Sadducees didn't like that. But what I find interesting is what was it that caused the Pharisees to become so unspiritual? You might ask. Why is that? That's the question. Knowing the spiritual nature of our people, why did they become so unspiritual? I don't know if you all remember, but 
about maybe I think three Sabbaths ago in one of our history bits, I had shared something from the book of Josephus that gave a description of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. And in that description that I gave, according to Josephus, Josephus had made the statement and he had said with regard to the Pharisees and the Sadducees that they were the only two groups, I want you to listen real good, that they were the only two groups that were not of the bloodline of Israel. You say, how can that be? Josephus said, that of the sect of the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essenes, he said, the Essenes are the only ones that were of the bloodline. And what Josephus was saying was that of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, at least most of them, they came from a line of converts. Now, many of us, you know, who are not familiar with that history between the what's called the intertestamental period, you know, we've been talking about Maccabees, you know, but from, from, from Maccabees and the Great War all the way down through to the first century, there was a whole lot of changes that took place. Because after, after the recovery of the temple and you had the establishment of what is called the Hashmonean dynasty, that Maccabean dynasty. A whole lot of stuff took place as you were going down into the early part of what is called the first century. You had a man by the name of Herod that came on the scene. He was an Edomian, an Edomite. And for those who are not aware, when the Maccabees had taken charge over the land of Judah, they had also taken over Edom or Edumea, and they forced the Edomites to be converted to Judaism. So you had a large influx of Edomites that had become a part of of the Judean Israelite people. And these Edomites that had converted to Judaism were also regarded as Jews. And what had happened during that time period, leading up unto the birth of our Messiah, you had a shift in the sect of the Sadducees and Pharisees. How did that happen? When King Herod became king, what he did was kill all of the religious leaders that were not supporting him. He slaughtered the priesthood. He slaughtered the Pharisees and replaced them with converts, Edomite converts to Judaism of his own stock to fill those positions in the priesthood among the Sadducees and the Pharisees. I'm trying to help us to understand some things so we can understand how did these Sadducees become so unspiritual? See, when you're dealing with peoples who have a different motive and a different agenda, They claiming descent from Abraham because Edom, Esau, comes from Abraham, but they never experience the suffering, the bondage, the persecution amen. that the blood descended Israelites experience. Yes, amen. But yet now they were in a position of power and control. And when they had got in those positions, mm -hmm. oh. Oh, you, you, you're going to have to check the history out. I'm just trying to help to explain some things. Yes, yes. 
When they got in those positions, their whole aim and agenda was to control the people and not to do the service of Elohim. That's why you had Sadducees that didn't believe in no resurrection. That's why you had Sadducees that didn't believe in angels. That's why you had Sadducees that did not believe in the moving of the supernatural, but they were the very ones that was controlling the temple. Mm -hmm. What kind of sense does that make? Mm. Yes, yes. So why do you think Paul would call the quote-unquote high priest a whitewashed wall? Mm -hmm. Because he knew his spirit. Paul was a spiritual man filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was able to read these so-called leaders yes. that were in these positions. Yes, yes. Oh, come on here. Yes, amen. He, he called it for what it was. Yes, amen. Because he knew that these men did not have his best interest in mind. Why do you think that a high priest would have Paul struck because half of these men that were in these positions did not really know Torah themselves. I'm going to lay it down. I know I'm taking my time and I'm, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm doing a lot of teaching on some stuff. But we as believers, we need to know this history. We read our Bibles and we just are in the fog as to the why and the wherefores. These things are happening because there was... Folks that was brought in, as the Bible says, crept in on the wares. Well, in this situation, Herod slaughtered yeah. <laughs> those bloodline descendants that were the rightful heirs to the temple and brought in Edomite converts. Yes. And Josephus testifies to the fact. Not my words, folks. I'm not, I'm not saying something out the side of my neck. I'm, I'm trying to help us to see some things a little bit clearly. Mm -hmm. But with this uproar that occurred, Paul got off the hook. Yes, yes. <laughs> Clever Paul uh -huh. got off the hook. <laughs> That's it. Sometimes, as we're navigating through this life, trying to serve Elohim and do what is right. There are systems in our world, corrupt systems in our age, much like the ones of the past. There are religious systems that have the shroud that they love Elohim, that have this shroud, that they love the ways of the Most High, have this shroud that, 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 that you know, we are Elohim's people. But when you begin to peel the layers back, when you begin to make the parallel between what the scriptures actually say and what the practices of the people and the system, you begin to see differences between what the scripture indicates and what is practiced. And what I'm saying today is that the Almighty is raising up men and women yes. that are going to look into this book yes. and that is going to declare the truth Hallelujah. among the wicked and the perverse oh, yeah. religious Christian system yes. that we live yes. in today. Yes, Some are probably saying, Mode, you going a little far out there. I don't care what anybody has to say. Amen. Whatever I preach is going to always be backed up by what the word says. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Oh, yeah. Here a little, there a little. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you the history and bring you down the line. I'm going to tell you who was where and bring you down the line. Yeah. And then bring it all up to speed. So we can see the real picture. You see, the problem yes, is yes. when you have religious systems that paint a false picture and want to give it to you. And that's all you know. And you don't have other information and other resources to validate or verify whether that picture is accurate. All you know is what's been fed to you. But the ancient fathers yes. left a record. The ancient fathers.
fathers left a testimony. Mm -hmm. The ancient fathers left something and they call upon us. Hallelujah. Yeah, the yeah. Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit is calling us to go back and to recover what the ancient fathers left and bring that information to the generation that's been blinded. Yes, I say that's been blinded. Yes, 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 amen. See, think yes, about, amen. think about people. Thing about folks that are in blindness is that they don't know that they're blind. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what's interesting. The very ones that are think that they are in the light, that they are in truth, are the very ones that are blind. See the Bible. <laughs> I'm gonna wrap this up. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation. It makes a statement. And it says, Come out of Babylon, my people, and be not entangled with her sins. Now, I've got to ask myself the question. What does that mean? You know, some people will try to use that verse and say, well, we're not supposed to be of the world. What Messiah already said, that we're in the world, but we're not of it. Right? We're in the world, but we're not of it. So when he talked about Babylon and being in Babylon, he's not talking about being in this physical world. Because Babylon is a religious system. Hello, somebody. Mm -hmm. Babylon is a religious system. And it's saying to his people, you that are in Babylon, in this religious system, come out of that religious system, my people. Don't be entangled with her sins. Now, my question is, how did the people of Elohim get in Babylon? That's my question. See, the, the word is a prophetic word referring to the future. I know in my development and in my growth in Messiah, as I began to understand who Babylon is, you have to find out who Babylon was in order to find out who Babylon is. And I began to discover that much of the practices within many of the denominational systems were all done in Babylon, I had to ask myself the question. These are things that are displeasing to the Most High, Yahuwah. These are things that he repudiates. Then why is it that the whole world is practicing it because the people of Elohim are in Babylon, just like the Bible prophesied. And this prophecy came to declare to his people in the last times, come out of Babylon, my people, and do not be entangled with her sins. Mm -hmm. There are many today that do not want to admit the fact that Babylon is in the church. They don't want to admit that. They're afraid to admit that. They're scared to admit that. I'm thankful for many of the reformers way back in the 1800s. They didn't have a problem with calling the Roman Catholic Church Babylon. They saw the picture. Many of them lost their lives for what they preached. Yes, yes. Many of them were not famous because of what they preached. But now today, you've got just about most of those mainline denominational Protestant structures that are in complete alignment with the Roman Catholic Church. And by the way, the Roman Catholic Church is spewing out information today basically saying that all roads lead to the same God. 
Not my words. Go look it up for yourself. Mm -hmm. And the most I prophesied, mm, come out of Babylon, my people. I'm trying to help Zion wake up. Yes. Amen. I don't care if you like what I'm preaching or not. I'm trying to help Zion wake up. When we go through these chapters in Acts, we're seeing a great many parallels. We're seeing religious systems that were corrupted. And how the Most High raises his people up. These parallels are here to teach us how we are to be in our generation. That we need to have eyes to see, ears to hear, and boldness of the Ruach to declare the truth among the people. We so concerned about being nice to everybody. When it comes to truth, you can't be nice. Mm -hmm. When it comes to truth, you have to tell it like it is. You can't compromise truth. I don't compromise truth for nobody. You want me to tell you why? Because every word that I declare, everything that I make known to everyone that I teach, I'm going to have to give an account for it. Amen. And many that are preaching don't take the way of Almighty Yah seriously. Mm -hmm. So it's important. That we preach this word. Amen. I love Zion. I love the people of the Most High. But sometimes being a father, sometimes being an elder in Zion, you have to preach and you have to correct and you have to make known and you have to trouble the water and you have to make people feel uncomfortable until they get up off their behinds and go seek the word of the elders for themselves. Mm -hmm. Bless the Almighty. Hallelujah. People in this generation are looking for a word of truth. And they are looking for men and women that are going to live their lives that is consistent with the truth. We're in an age of information. We're in an age where young people are able to, with the click of a button, to have information right at their fingertips. 30 years ago, some of the things that I had to go and research in libraries and spend hours and get 10, 15, 20 books, go to seminaries and buy books that they were given away because they were so old, these treasures of information, people are able to find with just a touch of the button. Yes. Things I had to go and spend hours and hours. Mm -hmm. yes, My wife would tell you how I used to come back home back when 20-something years ago when we were married. I'd come home with stacks of books and I'm going through this and going through that and looking. You remember that? Amen. <laughs> yes, amen. Now young people are able to find information about everything and they know about the paganism in the churches. They know about the corrupt. They know. That's it. Why do you think so many young people today are agnostic, don't want anything to do with the churches? Why? Because they already have the information, they see the hypocrisy, and they don't want nothing to do with it. So while many of us are around here doing the same old, same old, many don't even have a clue about the systems that you're in or thorough knowledge of the history of your Christian faith. Your children have been reading, and your children are aware. Why? Because we're in an age of information. Yes, yes. And they're wanting to see something that is consistent with what they read. Mm -hmm. They ain't buying the stuff anymore. 
So those who the Most High raises up has got to preach truth to the forefront. And when we preach this truth to the forefront, I trust in the Most High and rest assured that he's sending the word out and dealing with souls. Because the Most High is raising up men and women that's going to tell the truth flat-footed and be like Eliyahu that's going to stand against the prophets of Baal and will not be afraid and will watch the power of the Most High come down. It's important Amen. that we preach this truth mm -hmm. because it's going to be only by the power of Elohim that men and women will come to the knowledge of the truth. It's not going to be by convincing arguments. It's not going to be by the one, two, three step way of salvation. It's going to be by the power of the Most High. Yes, yes. That's going to break the hearts of people that's going to bring them to their knees. It's going to be them sing a able shake It's going to be them see a distinction between clean and unclean. And they're going to see who is on the side of Yahuwah and who is not. Amen, amen. The devil don't like what I'm preaching, but that's all right. All right. Yes, amen. I'm telling you, you better hear me today. The most High is going to show whose side he's on based upon those who walk in his ways and keep his commandments. That's what the Most High said. And this generation of people, they're going to be changed because of the power. Not because of how we package the message. Enough for that. Preach the truth. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. Preach the truth. Tell the truth. Live the truth. Follow Elohim. Love him and love people. If we do what is right and if we say what is right, Elohim will always be on our side and Elohim will always do mighty and wonderful things for us. Hallelujah. I close on that note. For those who have heard this teaching today that may be unbelievers out there, I want you to know that Elohim loves you. I want you to know that Elohim has a plan for your life. I want you to know that if you have been touched by the preaching, by the teaching, and you're at the place where you want to give your heart to Messiah, please do that. Turn in repentance. Tell him, I'm sorry for my ways. I turn from my sins. And I receive you as my Savior and my King. Give him your life. And you need to be immersed in water. Please contact us. We'd love to set up an appointment with you to have a virtual baptism. We do that. We'll do it. We'll do it by, by uh, some type of FaceTime or some, some, some type of way where we can have you immersed in water and pronounce the blessing over you. Contact us. Our number is 951-704-2831. Contact us. If you're out there and the Most High is touching you to be saved, contact us. We want to follow up with you so that you may experience all that Elohim has for you. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Amen. Abba, thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your kindness and your goodness. Thank you for your compassion upon our lives. I pray, Abba Yah, that the teaching has ministered life and peace, that it has challenged the hearer to go deeper in you, to be committed to you, that it has challenged the believer to be sold out to your ways and to your purposes. 
Father, I thank you for your mercies. I thank you for your kindness. I thank you for your goodness. And that you are helping us to grow up into the fullness of Yahshua. May you be glorified. May your great name be praised. And we will bless you. In the name of Yahshua, our King. Amen. Truly, we bless Elohim today and are grateful for his mighty working and his mighty acts. We trust that the word has been blessing to you, that it has ministered to you, and that it has strengthened you in your faith. At this time, we want to prepare ourselves to share in communion together. And before we do that, we want to have a prayer of examination, which is our custom as we make ready for sharing in the communion. And for those of you who have your elements, your bread and your wine or juice, you can present them before yourselves. And then once we finish our prayer of examination, then we will speak blessing over the bread and the cup. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your mercies and your kindness. We thank you for your goodness. We ask that you search our hearts. Purify us. Give us a right spirit. Let there be no ill will in our hearts or in our minds. But may our relationships we have with one another be righteous. Let it be good. Let it be shalom. Now, Father, we ask that you would be glorified as we begin to share in this communion together, this shalomim together. And may your great name be praised. We thank you in the mighty name of Yahshua. Ta Yahuwah Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lekem Min HaAretz Blessed are you, O Yahuwah, our Elohim, King of the Universe, bringer of bread from the earth. We bless you, Most High Yah, for our Messiah Yahshua, who is our bread of life and manna from heaven, Baruch Hashem. Rukata Yahua Elohenu Melik Ha Ulam Bore Pri Hagafin. Blessed are you, O Yahuwah Elohim, King of the Universe, Creator of the fruit of the vine. We bless you for the spilled blood of our Messiah Yahshua that has been given for our redemption and healing in the renewed covenant. Baruch Hashem. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for Shabbat. Thank you for your precious blood. Thank you for communion. And thank you, Father Yah. And thank you. Oh, praise the Almighty. Thank you for sacred communion. Bless the Almighty. We thank Him today for this opportunity that we have to share 
in this communion together, this shalomim together, this well-being offering, because this is what this represents. We thank the Almighty for Messiah, who is our bread of life and our manna from heaven. You may eat the bread. Yes, amen. We bless the Most High for Messiah's spilled blood that was given for our redemption and healing in the renewed covenant. You may drink the cup. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, praise the Lord to me. Hallelujah. Bless the Almighty. Bless his great name. Thank you, Lord. Bless his great name. Bless his great name. Thank you, Lord. You alone are worthy to be praised, yes, and we Lord. thank you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I trust that each and every one of you have been encouraged and that your hearts are glad. Our communion with Elohim is precious. It is sacred. And I want to encourage us in our life that we don't allow anything to interrupt the sweetness or the sacredness of the relationship we have with the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to encourage each one of you to love him, read the scriptures, keep the commandments, be a blessing to others. Hallelujah. For those who are watching us by live stream, if there are offerings, tithings that you desire to present to the Most High, we would like to ask for you to go to our website at www.ncmmi.20m.com and you can click on the donate button and provide an offering or tithe to the Most High given through this ministry and congregation. You can also share by Cash App. Our Cash App code is dollar sign NCMMI. For those of you who have been uh, faithful and consistent in your sharing and in your giving, we want to say thank you for all that you have done in obeying the Father and giving to Him through this ministry. We appreciate all that you do and all that you have done. And may the Most High send His rich blessing upon you and your house. Hallelujah. Well, that's all we have to say today. This time we want to speak blessing and then be dismissed. Most I be praised. Amen. Hallelujah. Yevereka Yahua, Veis Mareka Yaer Yahua Panav, Eleka Viku Neka, Yesa Yahua Panav, Eleka Veyesim Leka Shalom. Now may Yahua bless you and protect you. May Yahua make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Avinu shalom alechem. Our Father's peace be upon you. Shabbat shalom to each one of you. Amen. Go in peace. Shabbat shalom. You are dismissed. Bless the Almighty.